Okay, Paul, if you want to go ahead, you can unmute yourself and you're underway. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paul Fusco. I work as a photographer in part for the uh, DEEP Wildlife Division based out of Sessions Woods. Um, so today we're going to look at a um, presentation talking about nature photography and wildlife photography in particular. Okay, so this is called Field Basics, Concepts and Techniques. Okay, and Okay, we're going to look at some field situations, techniques and approaches, and also we're going to talk a little bit about ethics toward the end of the program. So to start with, we're going to, um, you know, highlight something that probably most photographers are interested in, and that's action. Um, so what I can say here is that you want to look for a subject that's doing something, okay, and the more um, animated it gets, uh, as this snowy egret is showing, um, you know, the better it often is for photographers. Um, so snow egrets will start chasing fish around like this, you know, frequently putting their wings up and running across the water. Also, they can grab and eat a fish. Um, so they have quite a few things that they can do to help them chase down the fish. They'll take short flights and put their wings up to, to guide them. And um, you know, they'll dart around like this looking for, um, for fish food. Okay, next thing I want to talk about is pay attention to detail, okay? So you want to look closely at your subject. Um, these are ibis. Um, they're a large wading bird or medium-sized wading bird. Um, but we have two different species here. One is a glossy ibis and one is a white-faced ibis. Um, so they're very similar, but only by looking very closely would you see the difference. And you can see that in the color of the legs and the color of the face and the eye. And um, the bird in the foreground is the white-faced ibis. Okay, next we have a turkey. This is a tom turkey um, that's showing something that I have rarely seen. And he's got a double beard. Um, those strands of uh, hair-like um, structures uh, coming in off of the breast. Um, usually the toms have one beard. This one has two, so that double bearded tom is uh, something that you just don't see that often, and um, you have to look closely to be able to see it. Um, a lot of subjects rely on camouflage to keep themselves hidden for safety and survival, um, and probably one of the most uh, you know, standout um, birds that has this as a as a technique, you might say, is the piping clover, where their chicks are so small and they just blend right in with their uh, beach surroundings. Um, this guy is kind of in the middle of the frame, slightly to the left. It's a little tiny piping clover chick. So next we'll talk about being patient. Um, patience is something that uh, wild animals um, that are on their own schedule. They're not you know, looking at you to, um, they're not looking at you to be able to come in, get your picture and then leave, okay? They're gonna go about their business. If it takes them, you know, quite a long time to do what they wanna do and present themselves for a picture, then that's what they're gonna do. So in this case here, this is a Northern Hawk Owl photographed in Alaska. Um, I was with a group of four, there are four of us, and we found this bird on the side of the road up there in Nome, Alaska. And we, we got our fill with this bird just sitting on a, on a willow branch. Um, so I wasn't quite ready to leave. The others wanted to leave. They all packed their gear into the car. We we're ready to move on. When the, the owl darted down into the brush and came right back up to the same perch that he was on previously, this time he's carrying a bowl. And it presented an uh, awesome photo opportunity. The others were scrambling to get their gear out of the car while I was all set up still. So I had a little more patience than they did on this one. Uh, here we have a common term. Uh, the juvenile on the right is constantly squawking and begging for food. 
So I knew that if I gave it some time, the adult would come in sooner or later with a fish to feed it. And that's what's going on here. I had to wait, you know, maybe 10 minutes uh, for the adult to come in with the fish. Um, but it presented this photo opportunity. Here's a black bear. What I like about this one is he's got a V, the white V on his chest, which you see on some of the bears in Connecticut. Um, but this animal was up at Sessions Woods in Burlington. And I was sitting on the side of the trail and I heard, you know, this noise over in the woods on the other side of the trail. You know, some leaves rustling and a couple of twigs breaking. And then the sound kind of dissipated, disappeared. So I figured, well, I don't think that was a squirrel, so I'm going to sit here and wait. And I waited some more, and then about 20 minutes later, um, this bear came out of the woods, and it took a pause right there and looked right at me. Um, and once it knew that I was there, it turned around and went back to the way that came. Um, this bear has ear tags, so you know it was handled by our bear biologists. Um, but a little Photoshop work could take care of those ear tags pretty quick. Uh, one thing I would recommend to people is to know your subject. Get to learn what it is that you're taking a picture of. Um, in this case here, we have a black and white warbler, a small songbird, um, smaller than a sparrow. Okay. And, you know, to know the bird is to know where it lives, what it likes to eat, and what it does for habits. Okay. Like singing from a favorite perch. Okay, and um, it can also be seen and watched as it as it uh, catches food and either eats it or brings it to its mate or back to its nest. So this bird here was going about its business and I just kind of stayed quietly in one area and uh, it presented me with this opportunity as it caught a crane fly. So as a photographer, you always want to be ready because you never know what's going to happen. Here, uh, these are royal terns, and they're doing a courtship dance, okay, which, you know, the birds will go into that dance and do it, and it won't last for very long, so you have to be ready. Um, so, you know, I got them facing the same direction, and they, all, they both have their crests raised up, um, so it was, uh, it was a good opportunity there. And here you can see more courtship uh, behavior with a wider angle lens. Um, they're facing off with each other here on this uh, uh, loafing beach, I call it. It's where the birds would gather during the morning hours. So, you know, this action, action will happen suddenly, so you have to be ready. This is a turn that dove into the water right next to me, and it came out with a fish. This is uh, like a long nosed needlefish. And at the time, I saw that the bird caught something, but I didn't see what it caught. So I just turned my camera and shot a bunch of pictures, and I got the series of uh, the turn with the needle fish, needle nosed fish. And in this picture here, the fish was trying to get away, and it actually turned and tried to bite the turn on the neck. So, I mean, that was crazy because I did not even see it happen through the viewfinder, I just shot. So, um, I was ready for a quick action and that's how I got this uh, series. So next, we'll talk a little bit about timing. Usually the best times for photography are gonna be early in the morning and late in the afternoon, um, which can, lead to times that uh, your wildlife are going to be more active and they're going to be out feeding. And um, you know, the middle of the day is the time that they're going to be uh, more resting and loafing and sleeping. Um, but here, this is an early morning shot of a heron rookery. This is the same rookery in the late afternoon. So you can see the two different, um, you know, totally different looks that you can get just by time of day. Um, and also consider the breeding season, where this bird is in a different rookery, but it's got a little bit of color on the bill and uh, the lores in front of the eyes, and it's got the breeding plumes. It's, uh, it's in full display out there uh, looking for a mate. So, 
So what you want to do is to stay quietly with your subject, you know, just let it get used to you a little bit. And that way it's not going to be turning and fleeing or, um, you know, whatever you might do, try to hide, you know, but if they, if you approach slowly and quietly, um, you'll, he'll get used to you and you'll have more opportunity to get them doing their normal routine. In this case with the beaver, he came right out of the water, went up on his little uh, mound of uh, mud there. Um, but I also got pictures of him you know, chewing on a twig. And I got him coming out of the water carrying mud, which they use to build their dams and lodges. Okay, so this is a hooded merganser, and he's in like full breeding display here. He's like puffed up looking for a, uh, to impress a mate. But, you know, this bird was also catching crabs. So he was exhibiting some behavior that was pretty cool. Um, so I was watching him, trying to get him with the crabs. And because I already had him in the camera and in focus, um, I got this picture, which I didn't even see happen when I took the picture. It's another case where being ready is the, the thing to do. Um, but this here, this other merganser, tried to come up from underneath uh, the first one who caught a crab and he tried to steal the crab. Um, so it happened so fast, you really have to be ready. So next, as I mentioned earlier, you want to move slowly. You don't want to disturb your, your quarry. Um, some creatures um, depend on camouflage and stealth. Um, to maintain their secrecy, okay, like this American bittern. Uh, you don't want to stare at your subject because if it sees you staring at you, it's going to think you are some kind of a predator and it's going to get very nervous. So you, you want to try to look sideways at it or something to keep an eye on it. Um, so if everything goes right and you don't make any sudden movements, you can end up getting an opportunity like this where uh, the bittern uh, went down and, and grabbed a bowl this big one um, out of the grass, which you know I never expected that to happen, but it, you know, it did. So you have to be ready for those things. So if you're going to shoot shorebirds, you want to stay low. Um, shorebirds do not like anything that sticks up above the horizon um, because they think it's a threat. So by staying low, keeping yourself low to the horizon, you can usually get in closer and have more opportunity with shorebirds. So the low angle also renders beautiful out of focus backgrounds, making the subjects really pop. And so that's another advantage of uh, getting low with some of these birds. But okay, at the same time, you might want to raise up just a little bit uh, so that you can get a reflection if the bird is standing in the water. Now another technique is to do a water approach. Okay, so I saw these Godwits and Dowichers um, all gathered up on the point uh, of a peninsula. So by walking in the water, I was able to get fairly close and get this shot. Whereas if I was on land, um, for some reason they look at uh, um, an approaching person or whatever on land. It's more of a danger than if it was coming out of the water. <clears throat> so you just want to, you know, maintain your, your careful approach. And when you're done shooting these birds, you don't want to, you know, make them fly by walking right through their flock or anything. You just want to back up and slowly go back the way that you came so that you don't upset them or disturb them. So another important thing is to position yourself to get the picture. Okay, this is a, a series with a doll sheep up in Alaska. Okay, and in order to get this doll sheep, I had to first uh, use binoculars to see them way up on top of that mountain crag up there. <clears throat> and then I had to take 
uh, two plus hours to climb all the way up there. You know, hopefully um, the animals would still be up there by the time I got there, uh, which they were. <coughs> um, so once I get up there, I wanted to pick out the animal that uh, looked the best, had the best features, and I was able to work it like this. This is a nice doll sheep ram with, with uh, huge horns, with uh, nice full curls. So that paid off with this animal, um, that strategy going up that mountainside. And it, you know, it took to go up there, shoot the animals, and then go back down. It took you know the better part of the day. <coughs> so some animals will do some funky things. This one started rearing its head up a little bit, and then you know, made for an interesting uh, difference. A lot of people say that you need to be lucky to get pictures like this. But you don't really need to, to be lucky because you make your own luck. You know, luck is just a uh, combination of being prepared and spending time out in the field. And knowing your subject helps to pay off also. So with this bobcat, it was just a thing where I knew he was going to be uh, coming out in this one field uh, close to sunset. So I, I staked out an area and I, I just hoped that he was going to come out near me. Uh, and you know we did, and it happened multiple days in a row. So I was able to get uh, multiple uh, situations with it. So your time spent in the field usually pays off. And I got him hunting. He was catching mice out there in the field. So a lot of people want to know about how you get fast action pictures. So your reflexes have to be fast. Um, and your shutter speed on your camera has to be fast. And you have to anticipate what's going to happen. So you have to be able to follow, like a flying bird, you want to be able to follow it. Um, and, um, <coughs> you know, the um, fast shutter speed pays off with, uh, with some of those birds where you need good light and you have to you know, really, um, you know, kind of practice at it to get good. So we'll take a little break here and uh, we'll see if anybody has any questions. Okay, Paul, it's Laura here. We do have a question about when you're starting to try wildlife photography, would yes. you suggest using a <laughs> tripod or not? Um, even when you're, even if you're not starting, it's always better to use a tripod, but a lot of times a tripod isn't necessary okay but it also reduces your chances of getting a good picture if you're not using a tripod because if the light is not real bright um, you know, it might lead to softer pictures if you're hand holding um, your camera but you know there are situations where it pays off to be hand holding it such as uh, we'll get to that in a minute but if an animal is moving or bird flying you have more mobility by hand holding your camera rather than if it's on a tripod, which makes things slower to operate and slower to follow a moving subject. But the tripod definitely lends stability. And you know, usually that's a good thing. I still use a tripod almost all the time. So, um, you know, it, it definitely uh, is an advantage. But again, there are situations where, you know, not having a tripod is going to give you a better opportunity. Okay, and how many hours in a week would you say you spend in the field? <laughs> um, it depends on my schedule, but I always try to get out, um, usually, either early in the morning, before I go into the office, so before work starts, or late in the afternoon after work gets out, and then on the weekends when I can also. So. I mean, a typical week probably, I don't know, probably averages, um, I don't know, let's say maybe 15 hours plus a week on average, maybe a little more. Um, and, but the thing is too, you want to realize that, you know, the best times to be out are only going to be close to sunrise and sunset. <clears throat> so <clears throat> that limits your time a little bit also. Um, the middle of the day, 
you know, you can spend more time and stay out longer in the middle of the day, but the light usually isn't as good in the middle of the day, and the subjects are usually well, not as active during the middle of the day. Okay. So a couple questions relating to the um, photo techniques and or equipment. Does there's two of them here. So does the iOS matter and how close do you get to your subjects, especially if you if you don't have a great lens, but I know you do have a great lens, but just the same. Well, okay, so we'll talk more about that in a minute too. But the ISO setting on your camera, you want to use um, um, the lowest as you can. Um, you know, if you go into a high ISO setting, it's going to make your picture, you know, progressively more um, noisy or grainy looking, okay? But sometimes you need that speed um, if you have fast action happening or whatever. Um, so it's kind of a balancing sit, uh, situation. You have to kind of figure out the best balance for you and, and how you're shooting and what you want to take pictures of. So, you know, it's the kind of thing where a high ISO gives you more flexibility, but the lower ISO gives you more better quality. Okay. And how close do you usually get to your subjects? It depends how big they are. <laughs> you know, the bears I don't get real close to. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, but the birds, you have to be pretty close to these small birds. I mean, you know, 25 feet maybe uh, for the small birds. Some of the shorebirds want to be close like that also. You know, if they're bigger shorebirds or bigger, um, bigger birds like hawks or whatever, then you can know, be farther away and still get a good size subject in the frame of your camera. So you want to get as close as you can, but you want to be respectful of the subject also. Okay. So I think what we'll do is we'll continue with your program and then we'll have more questions uh, later. Okay, here we go. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about the elements. So, a lot of people say, well, it's raining or it's, oh, it's snowing out. I don't want to go outside in this. But those kind of situations can lend themselves to um, some nice opportunities. Okay, here I was doing a Christmas bird count this day, and it was, you know, small little snowflakes were blowing in the wind, and it was cold and windy. So I know that in conditions like that, that are super cold, these birds are going to be very hungry when the temperature goes down and they're going to be feeding a lot. And I came up upon this um, flock of robins on the side of the road that were feeding on winter berry in the blowing snow. So it presented a nice little opportunity. This is, this, I love this opportunity. This was up in Alaska. Um, Usually, this is in the month of June, in late June, actually. So, you know, birds are breeding, they're sitting on nests, and it usually is not a time of year when it snows up there. This is in Nome on the Seward Peninsula. So, um, the night before this, a, a strong cold front came through the area, and it left uh, a couple of inches of snow on the ground, but it cleared out the sky so that you know, early in the morning, the light was just pink. It was beautiful. So, you know, I was with a buddy of mine and we we're up there and you know, we said, well, you know, we got to go out and find something to shoot from this light. You know, this is great. So we did come across this western sandpiper, but we took advantage of the, um, the cold front that left snow and the beautiful morning light. And we got this one bird uh, up in a nice spot there in the light with a little bit of snow on the willows. So that paid off very nicely. Um, so around here in Connecticut, we get situations like that. This is a little snow squall that came through. Um, but you know, you want to make sure you also protect your gear um, in the snow and wet conditions. <clears throat> and one thing about blowing snow is that you know the bigger the flakes of snow, um, the more pronounced they're going to be in your picture. So, you know, if there are little tiny flakes of snow, it's not going to look as good as if you get these nice, you know, medium to large size snowflakes. So it really pays off. Some situations can be more challenging where you have these fast flying birds, peregrine falcon, for instance, here. 
Um, and this is a slow moving guy, but he was on his way across the road and I was in his way. So you have to consider when is it that I'm going to get out of the way. <laughs> okay, here's another thing that I call challenging because it took me 25 years to get this picture. This is a screech owl and it was sitting in a tree hole on the side of the road on my way to work. So I've been driving by this tree for 25 years. Every single day I look over in that hole, there's nothing there. Except one day there was a screech owl sitting in the hole and I thought, oh, this is great. You know, I'll take, I'll take a few shots and I'll come back tomorrow with a, you know, a, a different lens for some better shots. So I came back the next day and he wasn't there. Day after, he wasn't there. I never saw him again. It was only that one day that he was there in this one hole that was, it's a nice hole because it was shaped like a heart. So I loved it. And, um, you know, it, it, it's just the kind of thing where 25 years it took me to get this one picture, but it's just a little screech owl. Mm -hmm. So, um, small, fast flying birds can be very hard. You really have to um, spend some time with them and, you know, try to keep your focus on them as they're flying by, make sure exposure is good. And, you know, you're going to end up with a lot of soft pictures, but you, know, you do get some that are going to be a standout. This is a least turn carrying a fish, uh, and he was whipping by very fast. Uh, you can see his wings are kind of, uh, other primary feathers on his wings are kind of swept back a little bit, and his tail is folded in. So he was moving fast. Um, but you want to position yourself um, in a good spot according to the light. Okay, so you can keep the sun behind you, and um, that way you'll get the best uh, um, shutter speeds to use for uh, fast flying birds like this. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, this is a little clear winged moth that was moving around constantly. I mean, it was. It was very difficult to get them in a good place with a good light and you know, get them clear of the flower itself in a position with his wings that look good. And it was just very challenging because you know, I took a lot of pictures of this guy and you know, this is one of my favorite ones here. But um, you know, it required patience and uh, <clears throat> good light in order to make this work. And now uh, somebody asked a question about tripod or hand holding. So I took the lens off the tripod for this picture to hand hold a big lens because I saw the osprey flying towards me. It kind of veered away a little bit, but I knew that if I kept the camera on the tripod, my mobility would be reduced and I might not get the shot. So I took the lens off the tripod, hand holding the lens in the camera. I was able to get a few frames while well, the osprey flew past me. And again, this is a, a situation in where it happened pretty fast. I knew the osprey was carrying something, but it wasn't until I looked at the pictures afterwards that I see it's a shark. All right, so you always want to pay attention to what's going on around you. Um, this happened in Florida. I found a, a baby barred owl in the woods that was calling, begging for food. So I kind of honed in on it. And I only took a few steps out of the car, off to the side, and um, I was looking at the, the owl that was sitting there, and I was trying to figure out how I was going to you know, shoot it. And I wasn't super close or anything, but all of a sudden, I got pounded by this mama owl. <laughs> Hit me right in the side of the head, almost knocked me on the ground. Um, you know, I turned around and looked around for somebody, because I thought somebody snuck up behind me. and. Um, and I looked up and you know, there she is sitting up there, up there staring at me. And so even though I was bleeding from the side of my head, I had to get my shot. So I kind of maneuvered uh, next to a tree trunk and um, mom stayed there watching the whole time and I was able to get a few more pictures like this. Um, in Connecticut, another bird that you don't want to turn your back on is a common tern because they'll come down and hit you or defecate on you. So 
Um, but you don't want to get too close to these birds. Um, you know, they, they just have a very ornery disposition during the breeding season. So, um, you know, watch your step with them too. You know, and I'll tell people not to give up because, you know, this is a situation where uh, me and my buddy one, one morning we're in Yellowstone National Park and we're looking to shoot anything this morning. We couldn't find anything to shoot. So the clock kept ticking and it was nine or 10 o'clock in the morning. We hit the road to try to move to a different spot. We're moving down the road and look out the window and I say, hey Pete, there's a, looks like there's an elk down there in the river. And it was through some trees so you couldn't see it that good. So we said, okay, we might as well check it out. So he pulled over and I started to walk down the trail to, to, to look at the situation and see if there really was an elk down there. Um, this man was walking back up the trail uh, toward me, and as he passed, I said, is that an elk down there that I see in the river? And the guy says, yeah, and he's got a wolf on him. So I'm like, holy cow. So we got all our stuff out of the van and went down to the river, and we were able to get some, you know, some nice and you know, fairly close pictures like this. Um, <clears throat> shortly after uh, this picture was taken, um, the elk laid its head down in the water and it drowned. It was exhausted because it was being chased all night. Um, but it turned out to be a once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, so we'll take a break here and see if there are any more questions. Yes, we have more questions for you, Paul. Do you have any tips for photographing snakes out in the field? Snakes. Um, well, you want to, if you can, position them into a nice uh, setting in good light. Um, you don't want to remove them from their habitat, but they're, you want to keep them in their habitat for the best picture. Um, and, you know, I would use a tripod and uh, because snakes usually, once they're comfortable, they'll, they'll just kind of sit there. So you can use a, um, a slower shutter speed and a higher aperture to get good depth of field on them. Um, you just want to make sure that you have good light and I would put them in a spot where um, it's part of their natural habitat. Okay. Do you take pictures of birds at bird feeders? Oh yes. Yep. Um, I've got a couple of feeders in my backyard. I, I love to shoot woodpeckers at the feeder and um, you know, finches and you know, all kinds of birds that come to the feeders. Yep. Okay. What, and do you, what, uh, uh -huh. once in a while you might also get a hawk visiting. So that could present an opportunity for hawk pictures in your backyard also. And do you ever use a blind? Sometimes, although I've kind of moved away from that recently. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but, um, I've used a, a stationary blind. I've used um, a portable bag blind. It's just like a big camouflage co covered uh, colored sheet that I put over myself and my camera. And also, um, you can use a car as a blind because animals don't recognize that a car is holding a person usually. So you can usually get a little closer and <clears throat> have your subject be a little more at ease if you're in the car. Um, especially, I'll say, for um, hawks. Um, it's much easier to photograph a hawk from your car, a, a perched hawk, I'm thinking, um, than if you get out of your car. As soon as you get out of your car, it's going to fly away. So, but if you sit in your car, you'll have more of an opportunity with it. And your car is actually serving as a mobile blind in that situation. Okay, how about any tips on focusing? Um, like, how so? Um, on focusing yeah, I, in on your, on your subject. Yeah, I like to try to keep my focus, my sharpest focus on the eyes or the face. Um, but, you know, it depends on the situation and um, the type of image that you're looking to get. Um, that's usually what I do, you know. and you know you can. Most cameras have different settings. You can either have like a ton of different focusing points, or you can have like one central point or like a combination thereof. Um, <clears throat> and I tend to 
expand the single focusing point just a little bit to give it a little bigger uh, box to, to focus on. So, you know, and you're you're using manual focus? No, no, autofocus. 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 Yep. Okay, and one more question before we move on. Uh, Daria would like to know if you ever do any editing to your photos. Um, just a tiny bit, you know. I'll bring them. I'll open them in Photoshop because I shoot raw, okay, digital raw uh, files, which have to be converted to a TIFF in a computer. And in the process of doing that, I might do a little bit of editing, or if there's a real distracting twig or something, I might try to take that out or minimize it somehow. But for the most part, you know, the best picture is going to be the one where you have to do minimal amounts of extra work on it. Uh, but I'm not against doing uh, that kind of um, you know, uh, image management, so to speak. Um, so, but it's, it's up to the individual photographer, whatever they feel comfortable with. All right. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, next, um, we're gonna say when it all comes together. So here we have an osprey. So ospreys are gonna be catching fish. They dive in the water to catch fish. Um, and what makes this happen is when the wind, the tide, and the light all come together, and of course the camera and your subject performing you know, with action right in front of you. So, you know, with um, a hovering osprey like this, he's looking in the water to catch fish. So he's looking for the fish. So the tide has to be bringing um, the water and the fish up into the, this creek where I was. But the bird will hover into the wind, facing into the wind. So the wind has to be coming from the right direction. But then also the light has to be coming from the right direction to get the bird lit well, okay? So you see um, this osprey has its face lit up pretty well with the sun and he's facing into the wind so he can hover. And he dove into the water, which happened like right straight in front of me in this creek. And the light was with me, the light was behind my back. Um, and he came out of the water with his, with his fish. This is a bunker that he caught in the water. And he, he's flying right into the wind. So the wind is coming from my back as well as the light. So that's what I mean when I say when it all comes together. Because if those two elements aren't in sync with each other and with you, um, this wouldn't have happened like this. So now we want to talk a little bit about ethics for the wildlife photographer. So just always remember, as a wildlife photographer, you are a wildlife conservation steward, okay? And people are gonna see you, they're gonna emulate you, they're gonna say, you know, well, if, um, if, if he can go out there, why can't I, blah, blah, blah. So but anyway, if you're a steward, you have a responsibility. Um, so be aware that sensitive situations require careful behavior by the photographer. So, um, Roosting owls are a situation that is a, a sensitive situation because these birds are going to be <coughs> are going to be um, roosting for the day. They're trying to rest. They're trying to get some sleep, um, and they don't want to be disturbed or have them or have them be found by a predator, um, which could be a hawk or something else. Um, so, you know, it's very it's a very sensitive situation. So um, by keeping this in mind, you can lessen the disturbance on those birds. So photographers should uh, try not to make noise, not to bring additional people uh, to them or otherwise disturb these birds as they're roosting. Um, and here's an interesting um, example. Uh, one year I found a whippoorwill nest at Sessions Woods in Burlington, in the woods. Um, so, you know, I found this bird and the nest when they were still when there were still eggs in the nest. And their nest is uh, in the leaf litter on the ground. 
So it's a ground nesting bird. So that may that means they're going to be vulnerable to begin with. Um, so you know what I did to try to maintain um, good ethics here is to limit my visits to that nest. Um, I would only come once a week, um, maybe twice a week um, during the time that that bird was incubating the eggs and raising the young. Um, so once a week, um, for the most part, and I was extremely careful not to leave a scent trail to where the nest was. So I didn't want to touch any of the nearby plants. I didn't want to eat food before I went in there. And I didn't want to touch the ground with anything except the sole of my shoe. I didn't want to kneel on the ground or rustle around in the leaves or anything like that. Um, so by being quiet um, and using a slow approach and a long telephoto lens, um, I was able to follow these birds all the way through from the time of little chicks all the way up until they fledged the nest. And this picture here shows one of the young sitting in front of the adult um, and he's about half grown in this picture. So just be mindful of the welfare of your subject. So as a wildlife photographer, you want to refrain from pushing your subject. If your subject changes its behavior, you're probably too close. If you feel that you're not close enough, you need to get a longer lens or use a blind. And we talked about that a little bit. And you get a stationary blind or a portable bag blind. You can use your car as a blind. And it also helps to put something between you and the subject um, so that the subject doesn't feel um, too threatened. And also, do not wear bright colors because they'll attract attention. So here's the situation. Using a car as a blind, I was able to get this, um, this action here with these fox kits as they were wrestling around with each other. <coughs> and again, um, when you're in your car, uh, a, lot of, a lot of subjects, a lot of wildlife will not see you as a threat. So you know, I love shooting from the car because you know, it gives me the advantage of kind of being hidden, but also uh, gives me mobility. <clears throat> and one of the best strategies is always going to be to let the subject come to you. And this is a tiny leaf sandpiper, the size of a sparrow. And you know, he just, as I was laying on the ground, he just came right up to me, just walked right up to me. Um, but if I was standing up, he would not have come that close. So it's just a good example of uh, some behavioral uh, choices that the photographer can make here also. So I'll say a little bit about social media, OK? Um, as it pertains to ethics. You know, in recent years, the popularity of various social media platforms have sometimes led to wildlife conservation concerns. Um, please be aware that photos of wildlife in sensitive situations or locations can and do cause more people to go to that sensitive place to get their own photos. More people almost always means more disturbance to that animal. Uh, and disturbance is going to be cumulative and can have a big impact on young birds, nesting, um, roosting, or otherwise stressed birds or animals. So I'll just tell everybody to please use good judgment and think of your stewardship responsibility before posting sensitive photos on social media. And most of all, when you go out there, just make sure to have fun. OK, so we can take more questions. All right. Uh, I wanted to tell you that there's been lots of comments on your beautiful photography, by the way. Thank you. And Jean would like to know if you have any special tips when using a pocket-sized camera. Um, well. It depends on what you want to photograph. Um, you know, a pocket size camera is going to be very portable. It's going to allow you to, to not <clears throat> have to hike around in the woods with a big lens and a tripod that 
I need a sharp one to carry around for me. Um, but um, the pocket size camera can be good for anything that is you want to be close to because you probably wouldn't have the same kind of reach as you would with a bigger lens. And um, so, you know, pay attention to more things like, um, you know, things that are close, back row type things, or, uh, you know, that sort of situation. And, but it all depends on what the photographer is looking to get. So, yeah, okay. good shots can be had with a pocket size camera. All right, that's good to know. And how did you get interested in wildlife photography? Um, wow, let's see, this goes way back. Um, I always had the interest in the wildlife. You know, when I was a kid, I used to catch turtles and I had a turtle pen in my backyard and all that. But, um, I don't know, I guess my father was a photographer, uh, at least around the family. Um, he didn't photograph wildlife, but <clears throat> that gave me a little bit of an interest. But then when I went to school, I met some people and, you know, I, you know, I became very interested in uh, serious photography. Um, and it's just that the wildlife part of it uh, was kind of a um, burgeoning interest because of my experiences and it just kind of developed on its own and blossomed, I guess. Yeah. Wow. So some photographers specialize in, in specific animals, such as maybe mammals or insects, uh -huh. but you... You take great pictures of many types of animals. Do you have a particular favorite group? Um, yeah, I have to say shorebirds. I love shorebirds. Um, you know, because they're just so, well, first of all, their plumages are beautiful. And there's many different kinds, big ones, little ones. Uh, they fly in they really cool flocks um, that fly in synchronous um, you know, formations and whatnot. Um, and there's, you know, they're just so respected because they, they fly such long distances. Most of them breed in the Arctic in the winter, um, Latin America. So, you know, we only have them here for a short period of time, most of them. Some of them breed here, but most of them just pass through. <coughs> but yeah, I think uh, the shorebirds are probably my favorite group. Okay. Um, a couple other questions. People are wondering whether or not you have a particular good lens and, and what's your base camera, your lens setup? Um, well, the primary lens and camera that I use uh, are a Canon uh, 1DX2 camera body. Okay. I also use a Canon 5D Mark IV camera body. Um, and we also have a Canon 7D Mark II camera body. But the lens that I use mostly is my 600 millimeter f4 lens uh, with and without the teleconverter. So that's my primary lens. Uh, but I use other lenses for doing different things like you know, macro um, work or small insects. I've used like a 300 millimeter lens or uh, 105 macro lens. And of course, my habitat pictures I use like a, a wide angle lens quite a bit. Um, so, and we also have a 400 millimeter lens that I use for some things too, which is um, better for mammals than big 600 because you know, most mammals are pretty good size. And what converter do you use on the 600? Uh, mostly the 1.4 teleconverter. Sometimes I'll use the 2x teleconverter. But I try not to use that so much because that really adds quite a bit of um, distance and it, it, it takes away two F stops. And, you know, there's reasons for trying to stay away from that. But sometimes you want to use it if you need the um, if you need to bring your subject in closer. Do you ever take any videos of wildlife? Yeah, sure. Yep, uh, my cameras will all take video as well as still pictures. So I'll shoot some short videos sometimes. Okay. All right. Do, does anyone else have any questions for Paul as we wrap this up? It's been really a great program. 
Paul. Thank you. A lot of comments about your presentation and the opportunity for share, for learning and sharing your tips. Uh -huh. Well, I hope to do more of these types of things in the future. So yeah, we can look forward to that maybe and, uh, and discuss that as we go along. That sounds good. Okay, I'm going to turn the program over to Sue. Thanks a lot, Paul. Okay, thank you, Laura. And thank you all for attending today. Just to let you know, we have July coming up, a webinar on iNaturalist and how to become involved with DEP programs through some citizen science activities. So that's for individuals and families. And also be watching the Facebook pages and emails for other notification of webinars from various state parks. So hope to catch you again in the future. Have a good afternoon. Bye-bye. Hi, Sue. Thank you.